You know, when we make mistakes uh, or we have some sort of failures, the, the, like the worst four words that you can possibly hear are the, are the words, I told you so. When, when people say that, it's just like piling on, isn't it? It just grates on your nerves because when they say it, it's, it's not in a comforting way. It's always said in a sarcastic tone, kind of a mocking tone. Well, they'll say things like this. I don't want to say that I told you so, but I told you so, like in your face, I told you so, and reminding me of those failures. You, anybody feel that way? Don't you hate when people do that to you? Because, it's again, it's never meant to be in, in a kind way. It always tends to be uh, a little um, confrontive uh, the way they do it. But on the other hand, I believe those four words, if, if they were in a different context, could bring, bring a lot of comfort. Like, I told you so in a different way that's brought in a more gentle way, a, a way of almost affirming that everything's going to be okay because I'm thinking now in, in terms of what God does for us. Like sometimes we'll look around and, and, and we're going through a struggle or we're facing some sort of a issue in our life or maybe a, a challenge or we've had a failure, whatever, and, and, and we're really seeking God. We've got a lot of anxiety and we're thinking, what's going on here? What, what's, why, why world is being rocked? What, what should I do right now? And, and I think God reminds us, he says, like, go to scripture. It's going to be okay. Everything's worked out. I've got a plan. I, I know there's going to be difficulty, but I've overcome the world. I told you so. Like, I'm telling you this to remind you that I've already told you that it's going to be okay, that I've got everything under control because I'm God in a more comforting way. God often kind of speaks in different ways. These days, a lot of people say, does God still speak? Well, he does. He spoke a little differently in the Old Testament in the old days, but he speaks differently today. Today, he speaks uh, through his word, the Bible. He speaks through the Holy Spirit in our prayer time. He speaks through other people. He through, speaks through our circumstances. But in the Old Testament, what we see in, is we see that God would speak through these prophets. Now, prophets were different than just people who were making predictions. This whole series we're going to be doing, this Christmas series, we're going to kind of look at this, this time of God's silence, the, the crickets, so to speak. Those times where we're waiting to hear from God and maybe we're not hearing from God. And in the, in, in the Old Testament, when God would speak through the prophets, these were people who, who God was directly speaking to, who were becoming the mouthpiece of God, and God would supernaturally speak to them and then they would speak to the people. It wasn't, a, it wasn't about predictions. It wasn't about somebody getting up there and taking some data and some, making some analysis and saying, here's what I'm predicting the future to be like. Because we all know that predictions aren't always right. Like we all make predictions about things. We think we know and we, we, we look at you know, maybe our, what we have uh, to, to assess the situation. We say, I, here's what I'm predicting. Every week during college football season, Pastor Jamie and and Pastor Kevin and Pastor Rod and myself, we, we had to do these predictions on the, on the college football games. And, uh, and, and, and Jamie will take about 12 games and we'll make our predictions and, and we'll text each other what those are. And, and um, you know, sometimes you're thinking, man, I know this, is, I know this team's going to win for sure. This is, this is a done deal. And then you find out those predictions aren't very, very, very good. In fact, I think I'm in last place. Uh, but, but I'm hoping to come back in the bowl games. But anyways, it's, uh, uh, and a lot of times, uh, you know, you think you know, but you don't really know. The fact of the matter is all of us are making these predictions, and none of us have got them all right because they're just predictions. Prophecy is not like that. It's 100% accurate. In fact, I want to give you some human predictions that, I, that did not age well, uh, just to show you what I'm talking about. Because again, predictions are just left up to some person making some sort of a judgment call, of what he anticipates the future to be like. So let me give you these really, really, really bad predictions over time. Here's the predict first prediction. I'll read the prediction and I'll tell you who said it. Here's the prediction. We don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. That was a prediction by Decca Recording Company on declining to sign the Beatles in 1962. Really bad prediction right there. How about this one? This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Who said that? That was a Western Union internal memo back in 1876. I'd say they missed it, wouldn't you? Here's another one. I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. 
Who said that? Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM back in 1943. How about in this one? The horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty. It's a fad. The person who said that was the president of the Michigan Savings Bank in 1903, advising Henry Ford's lawyer not to invest in the Ford Motor Company. Television won't last because people will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. That was said by Daryl Zenick, movie producer, 20th Century Fox in 1946. And probably the worst prediction of all. There is absolutely no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. Steve Ballmer, CEO of Microsoft in 2007. He missed it by a little bit. Now I don't feel so bad for Steve Ballmer. I did a little research on that guy. He, he has apparently made some other predictions that were better because he's the uh, 15th wealthiest person in the world with a, uh, a net worth of $115 billion. So let's not feel too bad for him. But the fact is these were predictions. They weren't right. They were actually pretty bad. And all of us have made predictions. Some we've got right and some we haven't. But a prophet, a true prophet of God, in fact, the Bible says that the, if you want to know if someone's a true prophet of God, if, if their prophets, if what they say comes true, it has to be 100% of the time, 100% accuracy. So God, what God would do is God would speak through these prophets in the Old Testament. And these prophets would come out, again, speaking for God. Now, if you know the history of Israel, you'll know that, um, that they had kind of a roller coaster ride with God. They, they would be, um, what would happen is that, that God would, uh, would do something significant in their life and they would be all on board with God and then things would be going well and then they would kind of go sideways a little bit and, and God would send a prophet and say, hey, you guys tell my people that they need to turn really quick or they're going to get the hand of discipline on them and then the people would just ignore the prophets or want to kill the prophets because they didn't like what they were hearing. And so God would bring the discipline and then the people would say, we're just kidding, God, we're not, we're not, we're not, uh, we're, we'll turn, we'll do whatever you want us to do. And then God would write the ship and everything would be good for a while and they, they would follow that pattern over and over again. But the prophets spoke for God. And when it comes to Christmas, again, we're in this Christmas series, that there are a lot of prophecies regarding the birth of Christ. But what I want to do today as we start off the series is I want to, I want to use the telescope today rather than the magnifying glass. I, I want to take the telescope and to have a 30,000 foot view of prophecy. And not only prophecy regarding the birth of Christ, but the birth, the death, the resurrection, and the return of Jesus Christ in prophecy. And I think sometimes what we do, I do it, and I, I think most of us do this, is we look at the birth of Christ and the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ and the return of Christ as, as like... Four completely separate entities. Like, they, like, like they're just random things. But the fact of the matter is they all kind of build on one another. As I like to say, you can't have a resurrection without having, first having a death, and you can't have a death before first having a birth, and so it's all tied in together. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at some prophecy. Actually, I'm going to give you kind of two statements, and then we're going to look at some prophecy but remember this, again, this is, these prophecies, what, what are great about these prophecies, this wasn't just a person like a Nostradamus who are just making some random predictions and every now and then one of them comes true and we go, wow, that was really good. And this wasn't some person make, making some generic statement. Like I could get up and go, I'm a prophet of God. I'm prophesying that tomorrow the sun will rise. Like, wow, we all, we all could do that. What you're going to find out through these prophecies is that they were super specific. There was no way it could be coincidental. It was absolutely the word of God who knows the future as well as he knows the past. And he speaks these prophecies to us. So here's, there's the first point, okay? And this is kind of ties in with the theme of this series. And the first point is this. In the silence, God is still at work. In the silence, God is still at work. Now, none of us like the silent treatment. You ever got the silent treatment? It's no fun, right? It's usually you're in a relationship with somebody, and, and uh, it, it, it's a kind of a juvenile way of, of dealing with conflict. So we're just not going to say anything to each other. We're just not going to, we're just silent treatment. We're going to pretend you, you're not here. Well, that's not healthy. We know that. But every now and then, people do that. In fact, I heard a funny story about a husband and wife who were having, a, they were at odds, and so they got into this, argument and then that didn't work and so they just gave each other the silent treatment and it was lasting I mean nobody wanted to be the first one to break it 
I mean, they were just going to, they were determined they weren't going to say anything to one another. Well, this went on for days. And finally, uh, the husband had an important business meeting he had to be at. He had an early flight. He had to wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And he was afraid he was going to miss the flight. So he decided, you know, I better let my wife know. But I don't want to tell her. I don't want to say anything. So he writes a note. And he says, I've got an important meeting tomorrow. I need to be up at 5 a.m. Please wake me up at 5 a.m. And he writes that in a note. And he puts it in a place where he knows that she's going to see it. Well, the next morning, he wakes up. He looks at his clock. It's 9 a.m. He is furious. He's about to go down and give his wife a piece of his mind when he looks on the bed beside him, and there is a note that says, it's 5 a.m., wake up. (laughs) See, God is not about the silent treatment. You need to understand that. In the silence, God is at work. God is always moving, always working, always doing things behind the scenes that we don't always see. But there are times when God seems to kind of go silent. If you've ever been in a situation where maybe you were praying or seeking advice from God or seeking some sort of wisdom and you just didn't feel like your prayers were going past the ceiling, it could be sometimes that's our fault. Like we've got unrepentant, unconfessed sin and God is like, you know, the scripture tells us if if we don't deal with that stuff, God's like, I'm not even going to listen to you. So it could be us, but sometimes it's not us. Sometimes everything's clicking with us and God, and we're praying, and we're seeking God, and we need answers, and we're not, we just feel like it's not, it's not happening. Where are you, God? Are you, are you listening? Are you aware? Are you moving? And, and we have to remember that, that sometimes we look at silence, and we assume that it's, it's, it's God saying, I, I'm not interested, or I'm not hearing, or I'm not aware, and yet God is working. He always is working. And what we see when we look at Scripture, back in the day here, before the birth of Christ, there was a period of time that was known as the 400 years of silence, where there was no new revelation from God, no word from God. The prophets weren't speaking. There was 400 years of literally silence. And what you look at, if you got your Bible and you know, the Bible is a collection of 66 books broken into two sections, the Old Testament and New Testament. The New Testament begins with the birth of Christ. But the Old Testament is all leading up to, it's, it's kind of the history of Israel and, and, and God's movement throughout history leading up to the birth and the death and the resurrection of Jesus and the return of Jesus. But when you, or if you're looking, thumbing through the Bible, you go to the last book of the Old Testament is Micah, and the first book of the New Testament is Matthew, and when you're going through there, you can thumb through that, it's like one page. I move from Micah to Matthew in one page. But what you need to understand, that one page is 400 years. And the nation of Israel was seeking God. Where are you, God? We don't hear from you. Are you moving? Are you, are you working? What's going on? And at this point in history is one of those times is actually Israel was doing pretty good. They, they had rebuilt the temple. They had stopped worshiping all these other idols. They still had a lot of other issues like we all do, but for the most part, they were trying to seek God. Where are you, God? And all they got were crickets. You ever feel that way? Here's what you need to know, that God is at work in the middle of that. God is like, God is orchestrating the events of the world. Let me, let me show you a couple of scriptures here to show you what I'm talking about. In Matthew chapter 3, okay, this is now ushering in the birth of Christ. There has been this 400 years of silence going on. And then you have this person show up on the scene, John the Baptist, announcing that Jesus, the Messiah, is going to be born. And here's what it says in Matthew chapter 3. In those days... John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching his message. Preaching His message was, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now watch this. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said he is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. So here's what's interesting about this. Okay, so this is, this is Matthew. First book of the New Testament, John the Baptist shows up and he has this message, prepare the way of the Lord, okay? Repent of your sins, turn to God, here's what's going on. Jesus is coming, basically, the Messiah is coming. All those prophecies that you've heard all your lives is what he was telling the Jews. 
All the prophecies about this coming Messiah. One day this Messiah would be here. One day he will redeem his people. That then, and John the Baptist shows up after 400 years of silence and says, hey, get ready. It's about to happen. He's about to show up. And he didn't just speak on his own. He goes back and it says, this was what Isaiah said. Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. And Isaiah said, there's going to be this guy that shows up. When he shows up, you know the time is getting really, really close. 400 years of silence, what was going on? God was working. God was moving. You know, the Bible says that a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. Time means nothing to an eternal God, right? God doesn't wear a watch. He's fully aware of time. He created time, but he's not bound by time. The 400 years is a blink of an eye for God. But he was moving. Think of God doing, like, have you ever done a big jigsaw puzzle? God is basically taking this, all of history to bring to this moment where the, for the birth of Christ. And he's taking the pieces of the puzzle. And he's putting it all together. What the prophet spoke, what he gave the words to the prophet. Hey, say this. And here's what's going on in history. Put another piece of the puzzle. And here's another piece and another piece. And this is what's going on. This is what's going on in your life right now. God is orchestrating parts of the story that you can't even see. You may look at your situation right now and say, this is, what I, this is where I'll always be. And God's saying, no, that's not where you're always going to be. I've got a plan. I told you so. I've got things in here that you know nothing about. Things that you will blow your mind that I'm going to do in your life. But you just need to stick with me. The work of God. Here's what it says. in New, This is also New Testament. In Galatians chapter 4. It says this, again, leading up to this event, but when the right time came, I'm going to come back to that. That phrase is super important. When the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Here's what it says. He says at just the right time. God's never late. He's never early. It's always right on time that Jesus is about to come onto the scene. At just the right time, Jesus came, born of a woman, to buy our freedom for us. We just finished an entire series on the book of Galatians talking about our freedom in Christ, the forgiveness we have through Jesus Christ. That's where it's found. And he said at just the right time, what does he mean? That he's saying just what I said in all of history this parts of the puzzle had come together for this moment in time for the birth of Christ to set into motion this redemption of mankind only available through Jesus Christ now remember Jesus was God in flesh coming to the world this was not a knee-jerk reaction this was something that was already predetermined from the beginning of time that God was going to do it but at just the right time in the nick of time God sent his son. So when you hear nothing from God, you can bet he is still at work. Now here's the second point, and we're going to get to some prophecy. What God says always comes to pass. Prophet 100% accuracy, that's what it means. What God says always comes to pass, always. You can take it to the bank. If God said it, it's going to happen. And I, it doesn't matter what your opinion is of that. It doesn't matter what my opinion is. What God says always comes to pass. Now, I want to show you from those four events that are really singular in a way, that the birth, the death, the resurrection, and the return of Jesus, I want to look at some prophecy. Again, this is, God spoke it through prophets, and now it comes to pass, even though it seems like when the statements are made, they had to have seemed totally Bizarre. Okay, so let's, let's look at the birth of Christ. In the birth of Christ, um, let, let's just kind of look at a couple of scriptures. And they are from the Old Testament. Again, these are hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. And let's look at these prophecies regarding this. Isaiah 7, 14. Here's what the prophet Isaiah says. All right, then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look. The virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Okay, think of that first prophecy. 
we have the, we have the benefit of hindsight. So it, it may not seem as ridiculous as it must have sounded in those days when this prophet stood up there hundreds of years before the birth of Christ and says, hey, check this out. The Messiah is going to be born and conceived through a virgin. Now, can you imagine anybody saying something like that? The Messiah of the world is going to be conceived through a virgin. I don't know about you, but I had health class in school, and it doesn't work that way. So if a guy makes a statement like that, he is either a little bit off mentally, or he's a prophet of God. This wasn't one of those, hey, the sun's going to rise tomorrow. This was a virgin is going to conceive a child, and not only any a child, but the Son of God. And not only that, she'll conceive it through the Holy Spirit coming upon her. That's more than coincidental, wouldn't you say, that that could happen? And yet, that's exactly what the prophet said hundreds of years before that. How about this one? In Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in a distant past, will come from you on my behalf. Okay, let's just look at this one. The, the, Micah said this hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. He says, oh, you, Bethlehem, are going to be the birthplace of the Messiah. Well, we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But you know the likelihood of that happening. I mean, think about this. Bethlehem. This was a podunk town. This was a little dot on a map. This wasn't Jerusalem. You know, this wasn't a big city. This was a little teeny tiny little town. A little village. Not even, have, no, no, not, not even a red light. You know, one of those kind of towns. And this was where he's going to be born. Now, you say, well, maybe they could have got it right. Okay, wait a second. But think about this. Mary and Joseph didn't even live in Bethlehem. How are they going to, how's that going to happen? Well, if you know the story that Joseph was a descendant of King David and he had to go to his ancestral home, which just happened to be Bethlehem, and now he is with his, his betrothed wife and he's going to have to go to Bethlehem exactly at the time she's about to give birth and it just so happens that she gives birth in Bethlehem. What's the chances of that? Well, let me tell you the chances of that. I've shared this before, but this blows my mind every time I think about it. There was a book written several years ago by a guy by the name of Peter Stoner. And it, the book was called Science Speaks. Peter Stoner was the, uh, was the chairman of mathematics and science at Pasadena College. And he writes this book about the messianic prophecies, the prophecies about Jesus from the Old Testament moving into the New Testament. And he says, okay, let's look, let's apply math and science to this. Let's figure out the probability of some events happening as they were predicted or prophesied in the Old Testament. So what he did is he said, let's take eight prophecies, including like the ones I just read. Let's take eight of those prophecies and let's run it through the mathematical equations. What is the likelihood of that happen? And here's what he found out, that the likelihood of eight of those prophecies coming to pass is one in 100 quadrillion. I don't even know what that number means, okay? So I'm glad he took it to the next step. He said, let me tell you what that looks like, one in 100 quadrillion, the chance of that happening, eight of those prophecies coming to pass. And he says, all right, here's what I want you to do. You might recall, I've shared this before. He said, I want you to take the state of Texas, the millions of square miles in the state of Texas, and I want you to imagine taking silver dollars and putting them on the surface of the state of, of Texas, every square inch. Now I want you to continue putting those piles of, 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 of those silver dollars all across the state of Texas, millions of square miles, and I want it to, until you get knee-deep in, in, in silver dollars. Can you guys picture this? Across every weapon, east, north, south, west, Texas, all of that covered, knee-deep, silver dollars, all of that. Then take one silver dollar, take a black Sharpie, put a check mark on it, mix them all up, all of those, all over the state, mix them all up, blindfold somebody, put on a blindfold and say, go look. And that person wandering through, blindfolded through the state of Texas and finding, digging through there and picking one up. And that's the one with the black mark, mark on it. That's the likelihood of eight of those prophecies coming to pass. And guess what? There are 108 that came to pass. If that doesn't convince you, nothing will. That is what God does. 
Whatever God says comes to pass. No, that's the birth that we celebrate. Well, let's talk about the death. Let's talk about the death of Jesus. The way that he died wasn't coincidental. It was providential. It was God, in, again, his infinite wisdom, coming, all, making this all come to pass. In, in Psalm 22, 6, it says, My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. Again, Old Testament. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. How did Jesus die? Nails through his hands and feet, right? Exodus chapter 12, another prophecy, Old Testament. Each Passover lamb must be eaten in one house. Do not carry any of its meat outside and do not break any of its bones. Psalm 34, 20. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous, not one of them is broken. Now, let me explain this, okay? Um, if you know the story of the Passover, this was in, in the nation of Israel was, was slaves to the Egyptians. And God sent Moses to tell Pharaoh, the king of the Egyptians, let my people go. Pharaoh said, no, God sent a plague. He sent 10 plagues. After the ninth plague, they still wouldn't let him go. The 10th plague was the killing of the firstborn of all the people in Egypt, all the Egyptians. And the night before it came over, the death angel was going to come over. And God told the people of Israel, his people, you take a lamb, you kill the lamb, you take some of the blood, and you put it over the doorpost, over the kind of the, the door jam. Because when the death angel comes, if he sees the blood, you'll be passed over. But if he doesn't, your firstborn will, be, will die. So the nation of Israel did that. And there was a Passover. The death angel passed over them. Killed the firstborn of the Egyptians. Finally, the Pharaoh said, all right, go, leave. And they left. And then when they got into the wilderness on their way to the promised land, they decided we need to commemorate that experience. And so they started this Passover celebration that they still celebrate today. Did you still celebrate? And they still... You know, the whole idea behind it was you take this lamb and you sacrifice this lamb, you eat this lamb, but you don't break the bones of the lamb. You go, what's the significance? Well, Jesus was our Passover lamb. Like, we don't have to face death because Jesus came and died in our place, and we can have life and we can have forgiveness in Christ. But here's what it says now as we move into the New Testament. And remember that, okay? It says it was the day of preparation, and the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies hanging there the next day, which was the Sabbath. Now, this was when Jesus was crucified. And a very special Sabbath because it was the Passover week. So they asked Pilate to hasten their, their deaths by ordering that their legs be broken. Then their bodies could be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw he was, he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water flowed out. This report is from an eyewitness giving an accurate account. He speaks the truth so that you also may continue to believe. Now watch this. These things happen in fulfillment of the scripture that said not one of his bones will be broken and they will look on the one they pierced. The smallest details of the crucifixion that because... It was the Passover celebration time, and they didn't want the bodies up there. Let's, the, the fastest way, if someone's being crucified, to, to kill them, they die from suffocation, but if they still have their legs, they can kind of lean up, so they break their legs, and then they, they die. But Jesus was already dead, so they didn't have to break his le legs. Well, that wasn't coincidental. That was to fulfill the prophecy. It's God working out and orchestrating his master plan. So again, the birth, the death, and then you move then to the resurrection, which again was totally prophetic. We knew it was coming because God told us so. Death couldn't hold him down. We know that. So there was this idea of a, of a resurrection. When an Old Testament prophet talked about a resurrection, there had never been a resurrection. He's talking about dead people coming back to life. They, they, they must have, you know, how do you even... How do you even process that in your mind? But here's what it says in Isaiah, Old Testament. He had done no wrong. 
and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy long life. And the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. That's Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, telling us this. The resurrection was totally told by God centuries before. In Acts chapter 2, here's what it says, New Testament. But God knew what would happen. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life. For death could not keep him in its grip. Aren't you glad for that? You know, it's, it's interesting that two of the four Gospels don't even mention the birth of Christ. Did you know that? Like the four Gospels, only two mention it. Matthew and Luke. Mark and John don't even talk about the birth of Christ. We're never, we're never even told to remember the birth of Christ. I'm glad we do. I love celebrating Christmas. But do you know that the resurrection is, is found in all, the death, burial, and resurrection is found in all, all, all four Gospels? Because this is really what, what we're, the birth of Christ is great because it's set in emotion something that's was significant. It was the death of Christ that brings us a forgiveness of sins. It was the resurrection of Christ that gives us hope for eternal life. See, it's all part of this God's grand scheme of things. You can't separate them. So they, they, they crucified him. They put him to death. Three days later, he rose victoriously. But let's talk about the last part of this that's still the unfulfilled part of the prophecy. Okay, those prophecies have already been fulfilled, but there are still prophecies that have, are still unfulfilled that, that God has told us about that are just as real, just as accurate, are just as sure to pass as the rest of those, and that's Jesus' return. Jesus returned. He's coming back again. Here's what the Bible says. Revelation 19. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is is the word of God. Remember John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has the name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is coming back again. He's not, when he came the first time, he came in a lowly manger in a, in, as a baby in Bethlehem, but he is coming back as a risen king, as a, as a king of kings, the Lord of lords, a warrior who will bring the vengeance of God on those who reject Jesus Christ. He is coming back again. And one thing that I can tell you, that we are closer today than we've ever been before to his return. You look at the events of what's going on in our world, and you can go to, to the pages of Scripture and see that we were living out what the Bible refers to as the last days. What does that mean? When is that going to happen? No one knows but Jesus. Right? No one knows. Not even the Son of God knows, actually, Jesus said. Only God knows. But here's the thing. Here's what I do know. That just like those other prophecies came to pass, the prophecy of his return is coming soon. What soon means, I don't know. I just know that we're closer today than we've ever been in history. I feel like sometimes when I look around me, I feel like I'm watching a, a, a part of, of this story coming to pass, don't you? We're living in some crazy times. Now, this is not about paranoia or, you know, you know build a shelter in your home. And I, I'm just talking about getting out and living life for Christ. That, yes, it's great. We celebrate as Christmas. We, we, we don't cheer for the birth of Christ. But let's remember that he's coming back again. Are you ready? If he were to return today, would you be ready? If you don't know Jesus, put your faith in Jesus Christ. Trust him as your Lord and Savior. 
Settle that issue for once and for all. If you're already a follower of Jesus, you need to be anticipating that with great anticipation. And the Bible says what we need to do is be prepared. Because it will come, he will come like a thief in the night. That's what the Bible says. And we're to be about his business in the meantime. See, the great thing about prophecy that none of this should come as a surprise to us if we, if we read the word of God. That God allows us, he's like him saying, I told you so. It shouldn't come as a surprise. I told you so. It's in there. I gave it to you black and white and, and in red in Jesus' words. Are you ready? Guys, as we kick off the Christmas season, let's, let's kind of focus beyond just the birth of Christ, but all the events of history to bring it to that point and beyond. Let's pray together. God, thank you that you have given us your word that is truth, 100% accuracy, cover to cover. And there have been people coming throughout history, the naysayers, the doubters, the skeptics, who've tried to discredit your word and try to laugh off some of what you've said. And God, we look and we see that everything that you say has come to pass up to this point and what you've said in the future is going to as well. And so God, I pray that every person in this room would recognize that you are going to return. And you're going to return as a warrior. As the Lion of Judah as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I pray that people today who do not have a relationship with you would say, I am going to be prepared. I'm going to invite Jesus to take away my sins, to be my Lord, my Savior, to trust him with my future. And if that's you today, whether you're watching online, you're in this room, and God is speaking to your heart, and you're feeling that tug of war going on inside of you right now, that you would... Relinquish control and give your heart to Jesus. And if you feel that you, you're ready to do that, you're ready to make a commitment, maybe a prayer, prayer in your own words, something like this, Jesus, here, right now, I give you my life. I give you control of everything that I am. I ask you to forgive my sins. Make me a new person. And I'll follow you the rest of my life. God, for those of us who already call ourselves followers of Christ, I pray that we would have a renewed sense of urgency recognizing that there are people around us that don't know you, that we have an, a, a job to do, and that's to lead others to you. Because the days are getting shorter and shorter, leading up to your return. So I pray, God, that we would anticipate that with great excitement and that we would be prepared. In the meantime, Lord, in this Christmas season, that we would recognize that you brought to this point in history at just the right time our Savior, the only one who could redeem mankind from his sin. Thank you that death couldn't hold you, that you are alive and well today, and that you're right here with us. And everything that you said is true. We love you and thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen.